Hi, everybody. My name is Neil Thompson. I am the founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. The first offering of the platform is a public speaking course called Teach the Geek to Speak. To learn more about it, you can go to teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Today, my guest is Dylan Reed, and he is the host of the Engineer Soft Skills podcast. He's a mechanical engineer by training, and the goal of his podcast is to help engineers with developing skills skills not taught in school. I'm interested to learn more about his podcast, obviously. And then since this, this channel is about public speaking, which is definitely a skill a lot of engineers don't learn in school, we'll definitely get into that too. Welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Dylan. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Where did your interest in mechanical engineering come from? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think just going through high school, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And I knew I was interested in math and physics and happened to be fairly good at those things and wanted to continue, continue pursuing that. And mechanical engineering just ended up being the, the route that made the most sense at the time. Oh, okay. You know, mm -hmm. I ended up doing materials engineering in school, but I did engineering not because of any interest that I had. I did engineering because my father told me to. Yeah, there was a bit of that as well. A bit, really? of, <laughs> a bit of just the thought of like, what will make a decent amount of money and impress my parents. I think it goes into your mind when you're an 18 year old making that decision. Um, oh, wow. Okay. You actually cared about impressing your parents. I, I that wasn't even my, that wasn't even my thought at all. So I was pretty good in math and science too, you know, as well. But when I graduated school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So my father said, do engineering. I said, all right. So that's, how I nice. ended up there. that's how I ended up doing it. <laughs> so, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. It's funny how, how much those, those, childhood things can affect what we go toward and end up doing for the rest of our adult careers. You know, when I was younger, I would, when people asked me why I did engineering, I'd lie because I thought that the, 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 the actual, the actual reason, you know, because my father told me to, was kind of lame. So I, I would always make up an, ex, make up something else, but you know what? Now I just, you know, tell the truth, whatever. It's, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The truth is good. <laughs> yeah. So I, I also noticed from doing some research on you that you ended up doing a master's as well. So what prompted you to pursue a master's? Yeah. Uh, my school set it up so that it was just a, a good opportunity. So I went to school at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. And at the end of the four years, they had this program where you could finish your master's in just a year. And then as I was exploring that, I found out there was an option to have a co-op at Boeing in St. Louis. So it would take an, a year and a half to do the master's degree while working almost full time as an engineer at Boeing. And I just thought that was a really good opportunity and didn't want to pass that one up. And I, yeah, definitely glad I did that. Oh, okay. So yeah, that, that definitely is something that, is that something that a lot of students do or is it more kind of just, the, I guess, minority of students see that opportunity? Yeah, my year, my the year I graduated was the pilot year for that program. So I think they just had eight slots open. And I don't even think there were honestly that many applicants. It was just a good situation. Um, I don't know if it's still going on or if it's a big program or whatnot. But yeah, it was a really good opportunity for me at the time. And I'm really glad I, I went for it. All right. So what does your work as a mechanical engineer now entail? Sure. Um, I work at a company called In Situ in Hood River, Oregon. Um, I'm, I'm from Portland originally. I went to school in St. Louis and then kind of wanted to move back. And my work entails some, I would say I'm a mechanical design engineer, but it kind of varies where I'll do some testing activities, some helping manufacturing, dispositioning parts that have issues. But for the most part, it's in design and coming up with, you know, creating drawings and doing all the engineering to make good parts that go on. So our company makes um, drones, mostly for military surveillance. And so it's, it's designing parts for those. Oh, okay. So you're a, you're a SolidWorks guy, I'm guessing. Yep, SolidWorks guy. <laughs> All right. So I really want to ask you more questions about this podcast. And, and so where did the, the motivation for, the, for starting the podcast come from? Yeah, so... I would say about the time actually that I graduated from school and was moving back um, to my hometown, Portland, I, so I didn't really read outside of school. I would do my schoolwork <laughs> and yeah, same. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I think at the time when you're in school, there's just this. You're, so much of your bandwidth is taken up by studying, and the last thing you want to do is crack open a new book for pleasure at the time. <laughs> yeah, you say that, man, but I couldn't even have that excuse because I, I'm the uh, same way now. <laughs> what'd you say? I'm the same way now. You know, oh, okay. when I hear people talk about, you know, what's your favorite book? I, I, I can't come up with one. I haven't read one in such a long time. I, I seem so uncultured, yeah. but <laughs> please continue. Sure thing. Yeah. So around that time, I, I, two things I would say. One, I was not super thrilled with how my life was going. I think I, I got into that first job at a college and wasn't really loving my life. And after college, there was this feeling in college, I think it's fairly easy to make friends. Um, you're just forced in this environment with all people your age and everyone's around and also looking for friends. Mm -hmm. And so despite not having the greatest social confidence or social skills, I was, I was able to have some success in college with all that stuff. After college, I found that really hard and <laughs> making friends and dating and speaking up at work were all just scary to me. So I think that was one thing, kind of feeling like dissatisfied with my social life and my, my ability to speak up at work, my ability to, to date, my ability to, I, I frankly just felt a bit lost in all these areas of adult life. And so the other thing is I discovered personal growth at that time and discovered the idea that you can improve at any skill. Like everything's a skill and you can just improve and grow in your abilities in these all these categories of life. And one of the most compelling categories to me at the time was social confidence. And so I started reading books about that. I actually, one of the authors that I was most interested in, um, his name is Aziz Gazapura, talks a lot about social confidence. I realized he lived in Portland too. Um, so I started going to his seminars and just got obsessed with that sort of stuff and decided I want to teach this myself. So that's essentially the idea with my podcast and videos and website. Um, I'm trying to teach engineers for the most part, social confidence and social skills, as well as more, um, more things specific to engineering, but kind of all the, all the personal growth skills that aren't taught in school that I think are still hugely beneficial in your career. Yeah. Well, I started my part, well, this YouTube channel and teaching geek in general is based on my own struggles with public speaking and noticing that a lot of the other engineers weren't all that much better at it than I was. So did you start your podcast because of basically your own struggles and then you saw the, the struggles of other engineers or was it based solely on your struggles? Yeah, I would say it's both. Um, I definitely had those struggles. I worked on it myself and I think I've become a whole lot better in all those areas. And I kind of got interested in just entrepreneurialism and in content creation and stuff like this. And I said, yeah, this is a total, the engineers I work with, not that they're specifically saying to me, hey, Dylan, I struggle with this, but it, it's fairly clear just from... <laughs> 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 yeah, like it really resonated with that one. Yeah. Um, just, yeah. just that folks, and you know, no judgment at all, but folks tend to be scared speaking up at meetings or right. tend to not be able to share themselves um, authentically when it comes to just interacting in the break room. Um, and I, I think these are skills that, not just skills that are helpful, but like things that make you feel better in life when you're able to, to authentically connect with other people and, and not be afraid of showing yourself. Yeah, you're right, man. It's not as if people are going to come up to you and say, yeah, I, I suck at talking in meetings. So uh, help, help me. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just, you notice it and you know, that's, that's kind of how that goes. How do you come up with the topics for your podcast? Yeah, a few ways. I think one, it's just things that I was interested in learning or something I've, I've, read recently and I'm like, okay, I'll talk about that on my podcast or in my videos. Another is, so I'll do um, every once in a while just coaching calls or I'll just speak with people and I'll realize these are things that they're struggling with. And in finding that out, I will say, okay, well, if, if one person is struggling with this or if I hear it as a common theme, that's especially an exciting topic to dive into. But if it's, if one person is talking about this, Odds are a ton of people also have the same the same question or the same issue that they'd like to dive into. So I think that makes for great material. Yeah, for sure. How do you go about 
promoting your podcast. Yeah, I could probably do a better job of that to be, to be quite honest with you. Um, I kind of put it out there and it's on my website, not a whole lot more and people seem to find it just organically. Okay. But yeah, definitely something I, I'm looking to dive more into, um, figuring out how to market that stuff better. Have you gotten any feedback on your podcast from the engineers that you work with? Uh, not really, to be honest with you. Um, do they yeah. even know about it? Some of them do. I, I've okay. told a few people, but I, I, I'm not trying to like tell absolutely everybody about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And so uh, I guess we'll now move on to, I guess, the, the public speaking part. So, you know, as you know, this, this, this whole channel is all about helping engineers and scientists with their public speaking because I see it as a, as a big need for a lot of us. We, we have all this technical expertise, but we, we str sometimes struggle with, with putting it in a way that non-technical people can understand. And I saw this, you know, firsthand just from myself. And then I noticed it from others as well. So when it comes to public speaking, has that been something you've always been good at? And if not, what'd you do to get better at it? Yeah, definitely not something I've always been good at. And I would say that one of the biggest things I can say on that issue is rather than focusing on sort of the content of what you're going to say, which of course is important, but I think especially as engineers or technical people, we can have this mindset of, you know, the content or the things that I'm saying are the only thing that matter. And that is just, that's far from the truth. And I would say focusing on your own state, your own physiology, your own psychology, going into a public speaking, whether, whether you're speaking on stage or just speaking up at a meeting or talking to people at your work, focusing on your internal state first is going to drive you to have to come across better when you do speak publicly and you'll just, yeah, you'll feel better as you're doing it. Um, and I, I think that's the biggest thing you can do. And I have a variety of, of things I could go into on that. Some are just, I went to a Tony Robbins event and I think of that um, as, as a fantastic way to, to amp your psychology or your physiology before any big thing that you want to do where you're maybe feeling a little low energy or a little stressed. If you just start um, amping your physiology, you know, beating on your chest and going, I got this or now I'm the voice is a big Tony one. Oh, and yeah. just, okay. it sounds a little, you know, woo woo or a little weird. Try it. <laughs> it's fantastic. It will quickly snap you from a low energy. Oh, I don't want to do this to, I got this. And that's so powerful. And I think another huge one is just focusing on your own psychology. So when it comes to something like public speaking, okay, if you have some fears, list it out. What specifically are those fears? What are the th things? I, that's in a journal. Is that really likely to happen? Or write out, you know, what a reasonable response to that thing would be. And I think just, just focusing on your psychology in that way can be a huge, huge boost to your ability to, to speak publicly and to do it with, with just authenticity and power and, um, and to impress other people. Yeah, I think I think you're right about that. When it, when it just comes to just having the right mind state, essentially, to, to to you know to do anything in life, you know, public speaking, you know, just specifically for this podcast, but you know, anything really. So, Dylan, is there? A, do you have a process for preparing your presentations? And if so, what is it? Yeah, I would say I don't have a specific process. Again, I like to really focus on the the psychology in my own internal state. And there's definitely preparation that goes into the content of what I'm going to say. But rather than write out a script word for word and feel like I have to memorize that, that can be so heady. That can be so in my head. And I would rather just feel good and feel confident and feel prepared while definitely having an idea of what I'm going to say and then go into that thing and just bring the energy and bring the positive state. And I think that that resonates with people a whole lot more than if you have the perfect content. And so I'll think about, you know, I'll really prepare for that thing. Did I get a good night's sleep? That's huge. Did I meditate or journal beforehand or do the things, and this might vary person to person, but what things get you into the most high energy, most positive energy state? And how can you plan for that? If you know you have a big meeting at 10, 
don't do work right up until 10. Maybe take 10 minutes out of your day and say, I'm going to use this to, to prepare myself um, and prepare my energy. And whether that's going for a walk or doing a little meditation, I think those things can be hugely beneficial. And we can be so in our heads as engineers, so logical, so process driven. So I have to memorize this. But what's really more important is just okay, where's my state at? Am I feeling ready for this? Am I feeling confident? Am I feeling positive? And when you're coming from that place, it's like, okay, I can rock this as opposed to the more heady place of like, I've memorized every single word. I, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to memorize the content. I think just your state matters a lot more. Oh man. If you're trying to memorize, memorize things, that's, that's, that's almost a death knell for a lot of presentations because then you miss out on something and it kind of throws you out of whack. And then now you're in this free fall and, <laughs> and that's when bad outcomes happen. Yeah. And frankly, even if you do remember it all, it, it can be so robotic. It can be so robotic to just be essentially reading a script that's in your mind. It, it doesn't come across as authentic and, and um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't reflect well on your presentation skills. Yeah. So being mindful of your psychological state, is that the way that you tend to cope with nerves? Yeah, I think there's, there's different ways to think about that. So I kind of think of like the short term coping with nerves. So if I'm going into a big event, how do I, how do I deal with the stuff that's going to come up right then? And then long term personal growth nerves, right? So things that used to make me incredibly nervous, like three years ago, have a minimal effect on me now because those are things I've just desensitized myself to. Um, you know, if for instance, just starting a conversation with somebody was super scary, I guarantee if you go out and have a thousand conversations with people by the thousands one, that's not going to be nearly as scary. And what you're talking about with public speaking, if you can just throw yourself into public speaking events, yeah, the first one's going to be scary. The thousandth one, I think you're going to feel a whole lot more prepared and a whole lot more. I'm ready for this. I got this. If nerves come up, I know how to handle that. If, you know, there's a heckler in the crowd, I got this. <laughs> um, and then in terms of like the short term, okay, I have a, a, a thing in 10 minutes. Just again, like really focusing on that state, really focusing on, okay, where do I feel nervousness and how can I, how can I treat that part of myself well? And be ready to do it. And frankly, you're going to feel nerves in the moment. There's, unless you're really experienced or just an uber confident person, there's nothing you can do to just get rid of that stuff. And, and I'm not even sure that you want to. Because first of all, nervousness can just be reframed as excitement. And I think feeling these things in the moment is not a bad thing. And we have this tendency to believe they're going to see that I'm nervous. Uh, maybe. Maybe. And more likely, people are worried about themselves and not necessarily <laughs> noticing yeah. all the details of the nervousness that you're feeling up on stage. It's not so obvious from the outside. Yeah. Um, and just being able to, I, I love the book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And yeah, that's a huge one. Just being able to, the skill in life of, I'm feeling scared. Okay, that's a sign. I got to go do this thing and developing the capacity to to feel fear to have whatever internally comes up for you whatever manifests itself as fear in the body being able to feel that experience and then do the thing that's a huge huge life skill yeah you're absolutely right about that i mean you, growth doesn't come from anything else but i think from that uncomfortableness i think there's a there's a thing about it it's like i don't know what it is but basically you know growth is derived from discomfort so you have to feel that first before any kind of growth can happen. And, and I, you know, it's funny when you mentioned that, you know, if, do people actually see that you're nervous? I, I've been in presentation when people will actually say before they start that they're nervous. Yeah. I remember thinking to myself, there was really no reason for you to say that because I didn't know, I mean, chances are I didn't notice. And now that I know, what do I care? I, I'm thinking about myself. Like, get to the presentation. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and frankly, even if you do notice somebody, if I notice somebody who does look nervous, I'm not, I don't care. We tend to think, like, if they notice I'm nervous, they're going to think I'm a horrible speaker. If I notice somebody's nervous, more likely I'm just thinking, like, oh, man, I feel you, man. I have so much compassion for that because I've totally been there. 
Um, yes, for sure. Just yeah. imagining the audience being on your side rather than, you know, these these enemies who want to tear you down and want to, you know, tell you your speech was horrible. They they want you to do well. Yeah, man, I, I fully agree with you too on that. And you know, we're I don't think people uh, we don't care as much about others as as others would would think we do. <laughs> Like, Absolutely, man. I got my own problems. Get to, to, get to your presentation. I, I, I got. I'm not losing sleep over the fact that you were nervous during your presentation. I, I got my own issues for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've gone to these. So I talked about Aziz Gazapura, who's a mentor of mine, and at his events we do things, and and I've done it outside of the events too. But we do things to inoculate ourselves to embarrassment and to judgment. So we go out on the street and we do crazy things that, that are meant to, to ramp up the feelings of embarrassment and of nervousness and fear in order to realize I can do this in spite of those feelings. And some have been super interesting because you think people are going to judge the heck out of you. You think people are going are gonna to look at you and, and think you're a total just social pariah. I don't know. So <laughs> some have been like cutting the line. So I, in a long line, one of the dares I did was just person by person, just step by that person and just stand right in front of them. Step by the next person, <laughs> stand in front of them. Step by the, I was freaking out while I did this. I was like, right. these people are going to all be pissed. They're all going to call me out. The people would just kind of like, uh, uh, my friend was paying attention to what was happening because they were behind me. So I wasn't exactly seeing their reaction. Nobody said anything. And, person by person they would kind of look they'd notice it and then they'd like look away because they were nervous crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's fantastic yeah there have been some other ones just like howling like a wolf in the middle of the street people look over and then they kind of look back at their phones right yeah, go back to their day <laughs> you, think gonna, you think people are going to be so locked into what you're doing and so focused on wow that that person sucks what an idiot but really they're just they're in their own heads yeah, man, we all we're all self-involved. Who are we kidding? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, are there any other tips that you could offer to people watching about becoming more effective in public speaking? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I said, I I think some of the biggest things that you can do is is to focus on your own psychology. I think Tony Robbins says that things we tend to think it's all mechanics, right? When I go to public speak. You know, how did I write out my script? How did I, how was my body language? Really, it's 80% mindset and 20% mechanics. So focusing on that psychology, on that mindset, what are the beliefs you have about public speaking? Is one of your beliefs that in order to do any public speaking, I have to be some, you know, high level executive who's always perfectly confident? Or is your belief, I can do this in whatever position I'm in right now and however I'm feeling right now. Looking at those beliefs, looking at your own identity, is your identity that I'm not a good public speaker? Well, that's going to have super a super big impact when you go to speak publicly. Is your identity instead, I got this, I can do anything, I can handle fear, and I'm a great speaker? Well, that's gonna it's going to have this positive feedback loop where because you think you're a great public speaker, you do more public speaking and then you get better and better at it and you become legitimately a better public speaker. So I, again, I am a huge mindset psychology guy and I think focusing on that is enormous. Yeah, man. If you tell yourself you suck, you'll be right every time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, excellent. So is, uh, how can people contact you if they want to learn more about you and your podcast? True thing. So you can find my website at engineersoftskills.com or you can reach out to me over email at dylan at engineersoftskills.com. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. So feel free to drop me a line there or check out my YouTube channel or podcast by the same name, Engineer Soft Skills. Wonderful. Everybody, this marks the end of Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I am the founder of Teach the Geek. I, and Teach the Geek is a platform for our science and engineering professionals first offering is a public speaking course called Teach the Geek to Speak. To learn more about it, you can go to teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Again, have a great day. Thanks, Dylan. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, guys.